All right, welcome back to our second chapter of our church history class. And uh, we were looking at, we looked last class just as a quick review of where the church began, uh, really from the Acts of the Apostles and, and the Holy Spirit coming upon the Apostles at Pentecost, right? And then we looked at how they, the Apostles scattered out uh, into the corners of the uh, Roman Empire. We'll get back to that. Now we're going to start talking about uh, the next step that the church took, really, which was um, a lot of it involved and in revolving around persecution. So we're going to talk about you know, that, that time from where Peter and some of the other apostles you know, scattered. And so Peter goes to Rome and some of the other apostles go you know, to all different corners of the earth. So from about you know, 50 A.D. or so, uh, we're going to look from, from about 50 A.D. to about uh, almost 400 A.D. today. So we're going to cover a lot of time. And I want to just say here, too, the important thing is, although I'm going to walk you through the history quickly, don't focus so much on remembering the names of the, the various Roman emperors or those kinds of things. That kind of stuff comes over time the more and more you hear it. So I'm going to say their names today because they're, they're important people in history, but you're not going to have to memorize them, of course, right? But I'm hoping that, you know, and I'll just give you a quick example. When I was in the seminary, you know, even when I was studying church history, the first couple of times you hear a name, you're like, I don't remember that name. But the more you hear it about a particular emperor or, or any, it really goes for any person in history, right? The more you hear their name, you know, some, somebody said it takes us 19 times to hear something before we really remember it. And so I'm hoping that this is probably not the time where you're going to remember the name of the emperor Trajan or the emperor Diocletian uh, and those kinds of people. But I want to introduce you to them just so that you've heard them and you can start to get a snapshot of what was, it was like there in those early centuries of the church as it spreads out. So we're going to talk, chapter 2 is from persecution to toleration to state religion. We're going to get to the end of the, four, uh, the 300s and we're going to find where, Rome, or where, where Christianity has moved from several hundred years of being persecuted for the most part to eventually kind of being tolerated, to then eventually becoming the state religion. So almost the complete opposite. It's like by the end of that, you had to be, or you were encouraged uh, to be a Christian by the end of the 300s in the Roman Empire, whereas for the first couple hundred years, you were put to death for being a Christian. So we're going to see how this kind of, this arc uh, goes and why it, it, it happens that way. Okay. I want to look at the different phases, first of all, of the persecution. Because I think a lot of times we think it was just all, you know, maybe if you have a kind of a basic understanding of history, you might think that the church was really just persecuted all the way straight through um, up until maybe the 300s, right? When in fact it wasn't the case, it was kind of hit or miss. One emperor would, would be really hard on Christians, and then the next emperor would, would be uh, much easier. So anyways... But phase one of the persecution really takes place, of, of, of the Christian church, takes place in Jerusalem by the people that killed Jesus, right? Those in Jerusalem itself, where everything happens in Holy Week, and Christ is scourged to the pillar, and it's the Jewish temple, it's occupied by Roman authorities, but Rome didn't really care about Jerusalem, okay? Rome has this huge empire, but whereas for the Jews, Jerusalem obviously was very important, right? And so those same people... That, that, that killed Jesus and the leaders, the religious leaders that were behind having Jesus put to death, want to wipe out all of Christianity right from the start. They don't want to just kill Jesus. They want to kill all the followers and, and, and at least uh, get them, you know, chase them off so that Christianity dies right at the, at the very beginning. Okay? So phase one of the persecution, again, as we said, happens in Jerusalem. And we see that going on. Um, where the apostles are put in jail, the apostles are stoned, you know, not to death, but they're, they're, they're punished and tortured at times. And the early church in Jerusalem really gets a lot of uh, persecution happening to it. Okay, this is one image of, we, we talked about Saul, uh, who becomes St. Paul last week, right? And we here see here the, the stoning of what we call the first Christian martyr, the stoning of St. Stephen, right, who was a deacon. And in the early church, and we see some people that are, this is a, a just obviously an, an artistic uh, image of that happening. In the background of this painting, you'll see the image of St. Paul, um, who at the time was Saul of Tarsus. And it says in the, in the Bible that while they stoned Stephen afterwards, they placed uh, their cloaks down at the feet of a man named Saul uh, as a sign, as, a, as, an, as an homage, as an honor to him. So he, here in the early, but again, we remember that St. Paul, 
uh, that, that Saul of Tarsus becomes St. Paul and converts and uh, repents of his. But this is what we see happening here is this persecution of the very early church right there in Jerusalem. Okay? Now, phase two of the persecution is much larger in geography. All right? And we're going to get to that here in just a second. So, phase two... It's no longer the Jews that are chasing down the Christians because, the, because uh, the Jews were really centrally located just in Jerusalem, right? Now we have phase two, which is the Romans begin persecuting the Christians. Okay, now why does that happen? We talked last week, this is Jerusalem, and as the persecution begins and continues to happen to the apostles and, and other followers in Jerusalem in the very, very beginning, after, right after Jesus goes back to heaven, in those early years, eventually the apostles scatter out of Jerusalem in some ways, in some, in some instances, to get away from the persecution. But they go all over the world, right? They go all over. Thomas goes to India. There's people going over to... to, to Peter goes, obviously, to Rome. And, and, and James goes to Spain. And, and they're, they're, they travel all over this, this entire... Uh, the entire continent, really, and, and even multiple continents, because they travel down to Egypt and, and Africa as well. Okay, now here's the deal. Look at this map. This is where the apostles go, okay? And this is the Roman Empire about the year 100 AD, right? So, if we look at this, the apostles go to the corners all, all over the place, but are basically within the Roman Empire, Right? So we see, here's Jerusalem down here, we see most of the places that the apostles went were to various places that are part of the Roman Empire. So the church gets very large very quickly because it spreads so far, but it also is very tied up in, and for the most place, where the church lands, where the apostles land, is already the Roman Empire. Okay? So we have this church kind of coming up in and spreading out among the Roman Empire in the 100 AD era, okay? So that's really important to keep in mind, right? This is the Christian communities by about the year 100 AD. These are, these are places now, these aren't just places that the apostles have traveled. These are places where full-fledged communities are up and running, churches, if you will, or even maybe we, we would want to call them dioceses, right? Um, These are really, so we see again, the church, because the apostles spread out, the church really takes root and begins founding some really serious, large, well-established communities um, all throughout the Roman Empire uh, and even beyond, but mostly within the Roman Empire. Okay, so the first persecution is as a name of a person that you might have heard in some other context or some other history class, right? The very first really Roman persecution of the church takes place under the emperor Nero, okay? So this is just as the church is getting settled in Rome, as Peter is getting settled in Rome, and they're starting to to grow the church, Peter the first pope, right? Okay, so everyone basically agrees, whether you're Christian or not, whatever kind of historian you are, everyone will tell you, that Nero was a, a, a psychopath and a sociopath of the highest order. Okay? Now, Nero, so he, he, he was just, he was not right in the head, right? Even before this Christianity stuff starts popping up around the town of Rome. All right, now he's also the emperor. So we have a, a psychopath as the emperor of the Roman Empire. Now, so what happens is, as with Nero, much of the fear towards this Christian church that is just springing up, Okay, is that most of the Romans didn't understand what the Christians believed. Right? If you think about this, this is happening in about the year 60. Jesus goes up to heaven in about the year 33 AD. Right? So it takes Peter a while, a few years in Jerusalem, and then he travels to Rome. So this is in the first 10 or 20 years of the, of the church arriving in Rome. And Rome's been around forever, Right? And they have all these other pagan religions, and so, you know, everybody had their own different gods that they liked, and, you know, it was all this sort of... It really wasn't like they were mad at Christianity because they didn't like Jesus. Okay, that's really important to know. It wasn't so much that they hated Jesus, at least in this Nero persecution, okay? They just thought, these Christians are new people, and they're not like the rest of us, you know? So... They didn't care if you, you know, that per- my neighbor, you know, has a devotion to this God, and, but I don't like that God. I have a completely different devotion to this God over here. Everyone was fine with that. 
But when you come to town with a new God, right, then, then everyone's like, well, who, what, what? You know, we, we've got hundreds and thousands of years of established religions and gods and deities. Why are you coming with this new, new God? And, and you have to, you know, you eat differently than us. You celebrate differently than us. You take care of the poor. You know, all of these weird things. And so the, 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 the Christian church there, at the very beginning, as it arrives in Rome, is really looked on just as strange, right? Different weird, not like the rest of the religions that were being practiced in Rome, okay? So they were, very, they were actually a very tolerant culture overall, right? But again, it was just the fact that, they, that the Christians had not, they were new. To, new. And, and so it was kind of like, you know, are these guys, what, what are they, you know, are they making up this stuff or what's going on and, and that kind of thing? Okay, so Nero, the sociopath, kind of realizes that he's, he's got this new group of people in town that's kind of growing, this, these Christians. But Nero had some, some desires to, you know, uh, build different buildings. And, and, and so, it, long story short, everyone basically also agrees that Nero burns, sets fire to the city of Rome, but blames it on the Christians. Okay, he sets fire to the... And, and then, of course, because... Now, the fire clears out the spaces that Nero wanted, okay... But now, once the Christians are blamed, what takes place, of course, is the first really large-scale Roman persecution of the Christians because they set fire to the city. Okay? So they, Nero had Christians crucified in the streets and, and burned alive as, uh, for torches in the streets and in his own gardens. Nero had Christians crucified, lit on fire, and burned to death uh, to provide light to his gardens and his dinners, outdoor dinners and all those kinds of things. Uh, of course, the, the Christians were thrown into the circus, uh, the circus being, you know, the, um, the, the gladiator games and, and the chariot races and were often, you know, mauled to death by lions. This is a famous painting of, of uh, Rome burning um, all the way down here. You got the sea and the dock, but then, you know, the whole city was essentially on fire um, again. And everyone attributes that now to Nero himself. Here we see some Christians. We see some people being crucified in the game, some people being lit on fire um, out there, and then we see other Christians getting ready to be mauled to death by uh, a lion and some of the other animals. You can find, you know, first-person accounts of these um, in, in in lots of places. Saint Peter was also put to death under the Nero persecution. Saint Peter, the first pope. Okay, and Saint Peter was actually this is a famous painting of that by Caravaggio, uh, a great uh, Catholic painter. And um, this is St. Peter being crucified upside down. He was crucified upside down because he didn't want to have the honor of being crucified in the same way that Christ was. So he asked his persecutors if they would crucify him upside down, and uh, they did. And St. Peter was put to death uh, there in Nero's uh, circus as well, crucified upside down. There were some more uh, things happening. Some other emperors came along after Nero and also persecuted the Christians. So from 81 to 96 AD, we have the Emperor Domitian. And then from uh, 98 AD to 117 AD, we have the Emperor Trajan, uh, who also persecuted uh, Christians. He was more merciful because he gave people the option, if you renounce your Christian faith, if you say, I used to be Christian, but I give it up, then he wouldn't kill them. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let them go. Right? But many people, um, you know, of course, we'll get into that more in a minute, this idea of giving up your faith in the face of persecutions. But most Christians obviously did not take that and, and sh instead chose death. St. Ignatius of Antioch was a person who was put to death under the Emperor Trajan. And he has, you can still read his writings, they are phenomenal. And he writes this letter to people, his most famous work is a letter that he wrote while he's on his way to being put to death in the Colosseum, in, in the, the circus of, of Trajan. And he says, when I get there, even if I cry out in pain, don't stop me, don't try to rescue me, don't try to save me. He's like, I want to die for Christ. I want to be torn. He says, I want my flesh to be ripped apart by the lions and the beasts, right? I mean, it is awesome stuff that just gets you fired up to be like, I need to live my faith in, in, in a way that matters too. So that was the Emperor Trajan. Okay, now phase three of these persecutions of the church is actually a peaceful stage, so to speak, somewhat peaceful. Pax, we call it the Pax Romana, which is Latin for the peace, the, the, the peace of Rome. All right, peace as in, okay, let's not kill each other type of thing. All right, and we, we call these the good emperors, although, of course, there were still persecutions. There were still 
small, but they were on a smaller scale. There wasn't the sort of outwardly, let's wipe all the Christians out that, that Nero had. Okay, so the emperors that we would see under this time period would be from about 117, um, you know, all the way into the 180s. So we have the Emperor Hadrian. Um, we have Antonius Pius from 138 to 163, and then Marcus Aurelius, uh, who was an emperor that the uh, the movie The Gladiator was based on. The Gladiator is not really uh, terribly historically accurate, but um, Saint Justin Martyr was put to death under Marcus Aurelius. Saint Polycarp uh, was a, who's a great saint and and got some great things to say as well. Uh, he was put to death under. So there were still people dying for the faith, but it wasn't that outward, outwardly large, massive persecution. Okay, phase four. Then we get so we had this we had this lull where for the most part Christians began to be tolerated for about a hundred years or so. Okay, but then we have more bad emperors coming to the surface and begin leading and again putting the Christians uh, to death and persecuting them on a large scale. So phase four we have Decius, Valerian, and Diocletian. Okay, so uh, Decius was 249 to 251. He was only there for two years. But he really launches the first empire-wide persecution of Christians. Nero really only cared about Rome because the church was so new. But as the church spreads, Decius decides to launch this persecution against the entire church all throughout the Mediterranean area, all throughout the Roman Empire, right? You had to have a certificate that said that you had offered a sacrifice to a Roman god where they could put you to death and throw you into jail, right? So... And the, and the Christians, of course, we believe very strongly. We would never offer worship. We would never offer a sacrifice. We would never, you know, do any kind of, you know, offering of any kind to another God. We worship only God, um, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And so the questions, the questions that start to come up here under this Decian persecution, could we forge a certificate, right? So could we lie to save our lives? Could we make up a certificate that says we did offer meat to an idol even though we didn't? And then the question also begins to be asked, which we'll look more at next uh, in, in further chapters, what about the people that actually give up the faith? Can they, be well, can they become Christian again? So it's this interesting, really important question. That we call that apostatizing. The, an apostasy is when you say you were a Christian, you've been baptized, you're practicing as a Christian and a Catholic, and then you leave the faith because it gets too hard. Somebody's getting ready to put you to death. And, and you're there, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the soldier has the, the axe right above your head, and you say, I give up, I renounce my Christian faith, right? Or I burn me to the idol that, that Rome is asking me to. Um, if I do that, the early church is really wrestling with this question, can a person do that and then come back? Can they repent? Can they be forgiven by God for apostatizing? Right? So we'll get to that question in, in again, future chapters. Then we have an emperor named Valerian, who uh, martyrs, uh, kills uh, many Christians as well. St. Lawrence, who was a great deacon in the early church and who's cared for the poor in a very dramatic way and was always out there with them, ministering to them. And then Diocletian, who was in 284 to 305, many people call his persecution the great persecution. He were, really wanted as well, up there with Nero, up there with uh, Decius, uh, Diocletian, the Diocletian persecution is a massive, large-scale thing. He, he just hated Christianity because he hated Christianity, and he wanted to stomp it out. Okay? So, phase five of all of this, of this persecution and this, this, these moving through the Roman Empire early on, phase five, I would say, is Constantine. The, the, a new emperor uh, comes along. His name is Constantine. And in 311, Constantine is facing an attack from... Um, from, from invaders. They're, they're getting ready to come to Rome to attack his, his kingdom and to probably put him to death and run him off, uh, etc. So he has a vision one night, Constantine does, and it is, he ends up recognizing or understanding later that it was Jesus Christ coming to him and he sees this image, this, we, we call this the PX, or it looks like a P and an X, this is two, two Greek letters. This is actually chi and then the Greek letter rho. And those are the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek. Okay, so the, 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 the X is a k, k, and then the, 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 the rho sound there is an R. So we get the Christ, Christos, 
was Christ's name in Greek. So these are the first two letters, and that's why you see that P in an X, although it's an R, a Greek R, and, and really kind of a Greek C, if you will. But this, this, this image is given to Constantine, and he said, he's told, put this in, in, in what, he's, what he's actually told is, in this sign you will win. In hoc signo vinces. In this sign, in this sign you will win. If you put this sign on your shields and you fight under that banner with this sign, you will win. You will win. And, and, and what happened, of course, was the battle looked like it was going to, you know, Constantine's army was way outnumbered and they should have lost by every account. But Constantine follows this, this vision, this dream that he had. He puts that symbol on the shields and so forth. And Constantine's army wins. Okay? And he always saw that. That was when he basically began to say, I'm going to follow this Jesus Christ. I don't know who he is exactly, but I'm, going to, I'm now a believer, right? In 313 then, just two years later, a very famous thing, you probably even learned it in your high school history classes, they have the Edict of Milan, which really is the first kind of pro-Christian decision by Rome. Uh, it's, it's Constantine and other rulers, they restore the property to the church that had been confiscated in previous persecutions, whether it was Diocletian or Decius or whoever it might have been. So the Edict of Milan is the first time where somebody actually rules in favor of Christianity, saying, we will give you back the stuff that we've stolen from you. And uh, so it's kind of like the first chance for Christians to really breathe. They're like, oh my gosh, we've been persecuted for basically 300 years, and now here we are, we're finally, like, people are... are, are honoring us and, and, and not stealing from us, not, not crushing us. In 337, the Emperor Constantine is actually baptized. Many people say, well, that proves that he didn't actually believe anything, you know, that he was just kind of using Christ. But back then, they always, they, a lot of people waited as long as possible to be baptized, even though they were believers, because they wanted to be baptized really close to death so they wouldn't have any sins weighing on their souls. And so he kind of waits until he's on his deathbed, essentially, and gets baptized. Um, and so then, the final thing that we'll talk about today, in 391, okay, at the end of all of this, this basically this 300, 350 years, uh, Theodosius, who is, who is the, the emperor in 391, makes Christianity the official religion of the empire. Right? So now, you, you, Christianity is promoted and, and it's now fashionable, and it's even acceptable and okay, and it's the official religion for you to become um, a Christian. And so a, a huge change from you know, Nero burning the city and blaming it on Christians in, in the year 65 uh, or so to 330 years later in 391, Theodosius makes Christianity the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire. Okay, let's move to our questions for today, all right? One of the emperors that we didn't talk about was an emperor named Julian the Apostate. Okay? In the margins of your text book on page 18, what were the things that the early church was doing that, that drove Julian, the emperor Julian, mad? Okay? I have actually a quote from the emperor hanging on both of my office doors, one at each of my parishes, right? Um, a quote from him about Christians. So I'd love you to go look and see what he said about Christians on page 18 of your textbook. So what was it that drove him mad? What was it that drove him crazy about what the Christians were doing? Um, and, uh, and, and just report that on question one. Number two, St. Ignatius of Antioch has an excerpt on page 24 in the margins. Many people say that the early church didn't have the types of structures that we have today. Popes, bishops, churches, priests, okay? When you look at St. Ignatius of Antioch on page 24, what types of things does he talk about that are similar to our current church structure? Okay, so just go read that little blurb by him, okay? Number three, who burned Rome and persecuted Christians right from the start of the church settling in Rome? Number four, what did the Edict of Milan do? And number five, what happened under Theodosius in the year 391? Okay, those are our questions, those five questions. You can write those out and give them to me at church or you can email them to me. I hope and pray that you have a great week and know that you're in my prayers. God bless.